Okay, a large body of, of literature, especially in Western civilization, uh, emphasizes the role of nobility. And one can think of uh, Machiavelli's a classic text of The Prince, uh, which clearly delineated the political dynamics of using the concentration of coercive authority uh, to impose a social order that expanded beyond the uh, group that was actually felt it had membership in the uh, political space. So the uh, state was confined to a, a subsector of the societal system that it reached out and imposed a social order to incrementally incorporate artisans and other uh, service uh, skills to help increase the potential and the capacity of the of the state to act not only within its own sphere but in its interaction with other states. Uh, in doing so, it necessarily came in contact with marginalized sectors who would normally be kept at bay uh, because they had no uh, connection to the state. They had no interest in the state. They had no interest being served by the state. Uh, they saw the state uh, largely as an enemy and an invader uh, whose only interest was in exploiting uh, their labor or um, uh, engaging in predation on the resources of the territory that they uh, traditionally uh, thought that they uh, owned or their, their own uh, political space. Uh, progressing over time, uh, we can take um, our examination up a notch uh, to uh, the, the precursor to the modern era uh, in which societal systems, at least in, in a large number of, uh, or a large proportion of the territory of the world, uh, reached a, a more ad advanced stage of development in which civil society groups uh, were starting to uh, ha be integrated uh, within the so uh, societal system. And we can also see the birth of, of a more stable uh, form of uh, democratic governance at this time. Um, and the form of de democracy that emerged at this time uh, was limited democracy. It wasn't a fully enfranchised democracy. There was no universal suffrage um, they, the members that actually engaged in the democratic process were a select group, usually male, uh, and usually already had a stake in maintaining the system. Uh, people whose loyalty could uh, basically uh, uh, be dependent upon, uh, whose relationship had the confidence of governing elites, and this is basically the model that emerged in Athens, uh, where you only had a very small uh, minority of, of landed uh, males who engaged in the democratic process. And so we see that model emerging as uh, in the modern uh, state system. Um, first, uh, well, in the United States as a working uh, model of democracy. So, we have an incremental model of democratic enfranchisement that builds on the classic model, but moves it towards the modern complex societal system. Early democratization processes in developing countries, uh, generally taking place prior to 1946, uh, took place in the United States and then in the imperial states of Western Europe for the most part. The United States able to democratize incrementally because the northern states generally lacked a landed aristocracy and relied economically on industrialization and the country in general was settled by entrepreneurs who had fled the rigid aristocratic monarchies of Europe. Uh, they had all of the tools and the skills necessary uh, to form uh, a more dense network of, of um, social groups, um, economic enterprises, uh, political units and having fled um, 
autocratic governments in Europe, uh, they were more inclined towards a more open uh, form of governance. That's part of the reason why they, they fled that context. Um, and so having a, pro, a large number of people with a proclivity for expanding the franchise of governance, uh, you see some uh, democratic experimentation going on uh, in the United States. Uh, on the other hand, landed aristocracies in the south of the United States based much of their labor on the import of African slaves who were in, excluded from political participation. This is more compatible with the classic form of, of governance in, in lesser developed uh, societal systems. And so there was a, a contrast in these two forms of authority, uh, which as we know inve inevitably uh, clashed um, as uh, state authority expanded to the point where the incompatibility between these two uh, approaches to governance uh, became um, an impediment uh, to further progress. So, in this model, the marginal sectors in uh, North America were economically encouraged to migrate to the frontier lands um, outside central government control. This lessened the pressure of the marginal sectors and challenging state authority, um, and they were moved uh, into the frontier uh, where they uh, no longer had to face uh, whatever incongruities or incompatibilities that they felt with the, the central authorities, and they could actually establish themselves as landed um, people uh, who would potentially then have a stake in the system once uh, state authority uh, started to penetrate into these outlying areas. And so you have an incremental expansion of franchise based on land ownership and stakes within the system, which continually pushed uh, marginal sectors, those disenfranchised uh, individuals uh, who didn't have a stake in the system, uh, to the frontier and expanded uh, territorially. Of course there was a limit on this and uh, it's at this time when uh, the United States uh, began to reach the limits of territorial expansion that these tensions between marginal sectors and this incongruency uh, in forms of governance uh, started to build tensions uh, within the political space. On the other hand, imperial countries in Western Europe had a similar frontier outlet for their marginal sectors in their colonial territories abroad. Again, uh, this affected uh, individuals or groups, uh, had incentives and had the technology now and the transportation capabilities to actually leave uh, Western Europe if they didn't agree with uh, the way the, the systems were organized and governed and then established themselves as colonies in what were considered to be uh, um, open uh, territorial uh, situations in other parts of the, of the world, uh, where you had lesser, uh, relatively lesser developed uh, societies where these groups would have definite advantages in establishing a social order. Uh, states in these newly industrialized industrializing countries uh, very slowly incrementally expanded democratic enfranchisement to include only those who had a vested interest or stake in maintaining the benefits derived from association with the state, especially in protection of their property rights. Um, it, expanding incrementally, of course, gave an outlet uh, for anti-state sentiments uh, in the frontier. It also gave uh, opportunities for civil society groups to work more closely with ruling elites and um, the Industrial Revolution really gave incentives for ruling elites to incorporate a larger segments of, of civil society. Okay, it would be appropriate to take a moment uh, at this point uh, in the discussion or the narrative, uh, I suppose would be better. But uh, to address uh, uh, a controversial and provocative 
uh, aspect of uh, circumstantial diversity, which we've already talked about, and especially uh, the external interaction and influences uh, among uh, societal systems. Um, what I've been uh, talking about in this uh, segment has focused on a single societal system, a complex societal system, and the development of that system as uh, from a holistic uh, point of view. Um, I have not dealt with interactive aspects or, or uh, circumstantial aspects outside of those that directly affect that particular uh, or common uh, principles of, of that particular sta uh, stage or level of development in, in complex societal systems. Um, it's a sensitive subject of uh, we can re refer to as issues of population displacement or involuntary corporate incorporation. And we might uh, talk about this in regard to uh, a clash of civilizations in which uh, a predecessor or indigenous uh, societal system is displaced territorially, uh, usually forcibly displaced, um, by a successor of societal system. Or when an indigenous population and uh, societal system is conquered or otherwise subjugated uh, by forces of an invading uh, societal system. Now, something uh, that is in, has been uh, variously uh, referred to as uh, imperialism, colonialism, or even uh, social selection, or uh, more pejoratively or pseudo-scientifically as social Darwinism. Um, this idea of social selection has been largely discredited, and I am certainly not uh, uh, promoting this uh, particular point of view. But in reality, we have to deal with the fact that um, there are more than one societal system in any territorial space in many instances. Um, as they uh, develop, um, they do tend to come in contact with one another, uh, they do compete over resources, they do uh, interact in various ways, and uh, oftentimes, uh, historically, um, when societal systems, as we know, have been at lower levels of systemic development, um, these interactions have uh, tended to be instrumental interactions or forceful, coercive interactions. Uh, even in cases where they involved uh, mainly cooperative rela uh, relationships based on trade relations, um, there were often um, instrumental uh, strategies that were uh, involved in these relationships. And of course we know that over time um, cooperative relationships are often associated to some extent uh, with instrumental uh, strategies. Uh, there are very few instances of pure uh, applications of, of strategies. So there is combinations of these strategies. So having said that, um, and recognizing uh, that uh, the, sub the sensitive subject of indigenous populations in many areas of the world uh, where developing societal systems were either uh, moved, uh, displaced, pushed into uh, different locations, or even uh, destroyed, consumed, uh, subsumed uh, various uh, outcomes when societal systems interact, and we'll deal with this more when we look at the interactions of what we, what I call uh, social identity groups. Uh, but focusing on, on, on the issue of what I would call induced state failure. Induced state failure 
can ha occur uh, from the outside, and, and so therefore the the term induced um, due to um, hostile or otherwise uh, coercive interactions with other societal systems. Uh, these result uh, from the interaction of social identity groups or societal systems, particularly at lower levels of development. When there is uh, some type of confluence of factors, uh, and these include uh, relative advantages and circumstantial capabilities, meaning that one of the societal systems or social groups is is stronger in some instrumental way than another, giving uh, the stronger group an advantage in using instrumental ed, uh, strategies, and also an incentive to prefer instrumental strategies as being uh, more likely to be successful in gaining advantages for that particular group. Um, secondly, uh, this issue of, of marginal sector push that uh, I've just been talking about to expand into uh, quote-unquote frontier regions, uh, regions that uh, the societal group has not uh, occupied uh, previously or not incorporated territorially uh, previously. Um, and I've argued that one way to minimize the challenge of marginal sectors is, is to have uh, areas available for marginal sector individuals who are dissatisfied or have no stakes in, in, in maintaining the system to move into, uh, to uh, shift their focus away from uh, their, their dissatisfaction with their relationship with the state or the, the civil society uh, sectors of the uh, more uh, organized and, and more developed uh, societal group and uh, change the focus of their activities on social mobility factors, uh, dealing with a new environment in which, in relative, uh, in relative sense, uh, they um, are part of civil society in this new location. Uh, they gain uh, uh, property and they become more valuable to the larger societal system and then therefore can uh, incorporate or be um, drawn in, co-opted uh, by the larger societal system on a more equal basis. So this is certainly in their interests to do this. So thirdly, um, because it's a lower level of uh, development, the, more, the likelihood is that uh, autocratic or instrumental authority is more prevalent in, in, as an instrument, uh, as a strategy for dealing uh, with uh, social order um, and establishing, maintaining that order. And fourthly, um, because of the lower level of development, there are substantial limitations on uh, political communication uh, capabilities and in innovation capacities. The ability to incorporate new or marginalized groups or um, indigenous groups into the uh, societal system. Uh, so this inability to communicate uh, creates barriers and really keeps them as separate groups. And so I've also uh, talked uh, at least uh, to a certain extent about uh, different social identity groups within societal systems uh, choosing separatism as a response to marginalization. And uh, externalization of identity, uh, maintaining external or separate identities, uh, is often uh, defines the relationship between these these societal systems uh, during this period of time. So, not trying to excuse this, dismiss it, or overlook it, uh, we really do have to be sensitive to it um, as being a factor in the development of societal systems. But when we focus on the development of a single societal system, um, it really is um, uh, secondary to uh, the development, although it's very important uh, as far as 
providing resources um, and stimulus uh, to actually push uh, the development process in that societal system. Um, so these factors at the lower levels, the clash of civilization, so to speak, where uh, two uh, societal groups that are overlapping territorially uh, can't find common ground to cooperate uh, to uh, engage in associational activities tend to be instrumental uh, until uh, one group uh, gains uh, ascendance uh, over the other group and uh, the results are an inequality uh, that's, that's in, uh, institutionalized over time. And these, of course, uh, serve to constrain the capacity and political will even of uh, social identity groups and societal systems to integrate voluntarily into more complex societal systems. And so these do tend to persist uh, over long, per long periods of time. Okay, one of the big changes um, in the development of uh, societal, modern societal systems uh, mainly in Europe, uh, was the Protestantization of religion. Uh, this led to decentralization and distancing of religion from state authority. Uh, no longer did you have a state religion that was fully compatible with state interests. Religion uh, started becoming more compatible with the interests of civil society. And in doing so, uh, it increased its put, uh, potential and its penetration uh, for expressing and um, interacting and with the marginal sectors and, and helping to integrate marginal sectors more closely with uh, civil society uh, and expanding uh, uh, the system uh, development in that way. Uh, <clears throat> decentralized religion then became a social networking organization that promoted the development of civil society and fostered productive relations with the state and a moral medium uh, for penetrating the marginal sectors. Political enfranchisement tended to expand as a function of economic development. By exploiting resources in the American frontier and expropriating resources in the European colonial system. So, the economic benefits um, of development uh, were paralleled by decentralization of religious authority, uh, decentralization uh, of religious authority pr presented a challenge to uh, governing authority. Governing authority then uh, was compelled uh, to liberalize in order to stay compatible with decentralized religion and to thereby ex expand the franchise uh, to account for the increasing number of potential shareholders or stakeholders uh, in maintaining uh, the societal system. Uh, the state maintained in relative capabilities by integrating emerging sectors of civil society. Uh, the revolutionary potential was dampened by the necessity of marginal sectors to control the resistance of indigenous populations in frontier regions. External interstate influences increased over time as colonial rivalries and competition with non-imperial industrial states increased. And so you see another um, important transformative point in the development of modern uh, societal systems as again the frontiers are reached uh, and so uh, moving uh, problems with marginal sectors to the frontier was no longer uh, as important an option as it had been. Uh, we also see an increase in rivalries as states continually try and expand their frontiers, uh, but the amount of frontier left to expand into is decreasing to the point where they're now uh, starting to uh, come into conflict in this desire to expand uh, into frontier uh, political space. And this leads us into tensions that ultimately culminate uh, in uh, the world wars of the 20th century.
Okay, the preceding uh, discussion has talked about uh, the emergence of uh, democracy and uh, according to a democratization process. Uh, the emergence of democracy uh, focused on uh, a single societal system developing uh, in relative isolation. Uh, this is the main reason why the discussion seemed to um, ignore uh, indigenous populations uh, or the effect of colonialization and the transfer of resources from remote locations to help augment um, the resources available for development in uh, the more advanced uh, societal systems of uh, basically Western Europe uh, and also of course the emergence of democracy uh, first uh, within a, a, mo a, co a modern complex societal system in the United States but still uh, in relative isolation. Uh, the current issue of course is that democ democracy does exist as uh, form of governance and is well known and the procedures, the processes of uh, democratic governance have been studied uh, and have been uh, further articulated, further refined uh, over the course of especially the 20th century uh, and in the beginning of the 21st century now. What we're seeing as a result is a greater push towards preference of democracy over other forms of governance, especially autocratic governance. Well, the argument has also been made, and will continue to be made, that uh, democracy is uh, a corollary of societal system development, meaning that a democracy is supported, is uh, emblematic, is actually an integral function of societal system development. So this supports uh, the proposition that uh, there's a uh, very positive correlation between higher levels of system, societal systemic development and uh, the uh, consolidation of democratic authority. However, uh, in uh, the 20th century, uh, basically as uh, a result of, uh, you know, a, as a, a indirect consequence of, of the world wars that defined the uh, 20th century, but especially the, the collapse after the Second World War of, of the colonial world system, uh, we see a greater push for not only the universal suffrage, including all uh, members of a societal system, uh, within uh, the workings of the societal system, uh, particularly in the governance of those systems. Uh, but also, um, a, a greater emphasis on uh, democratic forms and processes and procedures and voting procedures as a way to make decisions uh, uh, regarding public policy in societal systems. And if we chart uh, the nature of regimes over time, which we do, uh, using the polity uh, scheme, uh, we see that there is a, a constant increase in the number of democratic regimes. And we also know that um, not all democratic regimes are fully democratic, that there are mixtures, we call them anocratic, uh, that they have uh, some elements of autocratic uh, authority and some elements of democratic authority and some various mixture. Um, so the debate emerges about uh, the relationship between governance, forms of governance, and development processes. And there has been a, a great deal of study on this issue because there seems to be now a disconnect and some contrary evidence to our main proposition that there is an integral uh, relationship between the quality of governance and the level of uh, societal system development. The argument is that it's not clear that democracy is an end product and uh, people such as Amartya Sen have made the argument that democracy can actually uh, 
facilitate uh, societal system development. That bringing people in and giving them uh, access, opportunities, uh, making them stakeholders in the societal system, especially economically, in the economic uh, and productive activities of that system, uh, is um, a positive function uh, that will increase the productive output and decrease the counterproductive uh, activity within those systems. And so we now see situations where uh, even very poor countries uh, may have at least the um, superficial uh, trappings of democratic authority and democratic process. Uh, most likely uh, voting procedures uh, to choose uh, leadership at uh, the central uh, government level or even municipal uh, elections or, or regional elections. So what does this mean to the argument uh, that we're making on the societal system and the congruence necessary um, or the, the strong push towards congruence in these societal systems? Well, I think the answer to this uh, lies in the issue of what I would call, well, I've already called anocracy, which is a mixture of authority uh, structures and authority patterns, but also the issue of uh, incomplete, uh, false, or even pseudo-democratic uh, governance. Uh, that there is a possibility of democratic procedures existing at lesser levels of development, even though in this theoretical perspective, those uh, democratic processes would not be supported by the system, uh, which would make the uh, persistence of those democratic uh, forms of governance uh, uh, very uh, vulnerable uh, to change. And we, and we do see that when we chart uh, the course of, of governance over time in, in weaker economies, they tend to fluctuate uh, between more open and less open forms of governance, that they're very susceptible to coups, to what we call adverse regime changes, uh, seizure of power by personalistic or military leaders who Pose uh, social control through instrumental means. They displace uh, more uh, democratic uh, forms of governance, more democratically elected uh, leadership, uh, uh, deliberative bodies uh, such as legislatures, parliaments. And so we do see uh, movement back and forth between these uh, basic forms of governance. And so we have many different issues at play, but this is in the modern uh, societal system that is subject to globalization. So they're not operating in isolated context. So the circumstantial context has, is changing and has changed dramatically. And this affects uh, what form of governance is likely to take place under given circumstances. Um, for example, uh, donor countries uh, have made a strong push uh, to provide negative economic incentives to try and limit the number of autocratic rulers to try and promote democratic uh, procedures. Uh, they've, uh, especially in the more dependent uh, countries and these uh, that populate Afri the African continent. And we see uh, with the end of the Cold War uh, a great increase in the use of democratic process in these African countries, but um, many, if not most of these, uh, procedures are not well entrenched, as David Held would uh, call them. They're not well consolidated, and they're very vulnerable to uh, reversal. So we can see democratic uh, governments uh, with electoral procedures exist in poor countries and persist over uh, fairly uh, long periods of time, 20, 30 uh, in some cases, even up to 50 years. Um, how is this possible? What does it mean? Well, I'm not going to get into the debate on whether a democracy can actually foster economic development better than autocracy. Uh, this is really uh, tangential uh, to the main arguments of this approach. 
The main arguments for this approach is they, they go in tandem, they, they parallel each other, that one support, they're mutually supportive. So how does this happen? Well, what we really want to focus on and what I want to talk about in this, this, this final segment of this particular um, uh, part of the explanation of these models, uh, the complex uh, system models, is the tension between revolutionary potential and democratic uh, democratization potential. Uh, I've already pointed out that revolutionary potential uh, really captures um, the potential for action uh, that is seated in the marginal sectors and is organized by alternative state structures. That these state structures can be augmented or strengthened uh, by, uh, through their relationship uh, between marginal sector groups and civil society sector groups. A civil society can interact with marginal sector groups, transfer resources to them by employing them or, or uh, buying resources from areas uh, or, or groups that are organized in, in such a fashion. And so there is a, a symbiotic relationship or an intermediary relationship with civil society and marginal sector groups. <clears throat> and if civil society does uh, share interest with marginal sector groups and these come in conflict or overwhelm their interest in their relationship uh, between civil society groups and state uh, groups, that civil society can shift its loyalty towards uh, marginal sector groups to help them promote their interests vis-a-vis the state. And if push comes to shove, so to speak, if, if uh, instrumental strategies uh, do come to the fore and, and become predominant in, in defining the relationship uh, within, a civil, uh, within a societal system, then a revolutionary uh, action could occur. And it's really <clears throat> the, uh, the balance of power, really, between revolutionary potential and democratization potential, which counterbalances revolutionary potential uh, to a large extent. That if civil society groups are, have productive relationships, symbiotic, uh, compatible, uh, consistent relationships uh, with state groups, um, their loyalties could be split, which could help keep the societal system cohesive, but it could also mean that uh, civil society groups uh, form uh, more meaningful, productive relationships with, with state groups, increasing the democratization potential vis-a-vis uh, -vis or relative to uh, the revolutionary potential, which keeps the societal system on a developmental track, where as the, the, the system develops, uh, democratization uh, continues to consolidate and, and become uh, more resilient. So, in understanding the application of the model to any particular circumstantial context, which means analyzing a particular country um, and the uh, tensions, the forces, the resources, the, the skill sets, and, and whatnot that, that, that these uh, systems um, have that define them, uh, one has to take into account, of course, the external environment. We have an interconnected world now, not an isolated world of, of um, remotely, uh, individually uh, developing societal systems. We now are developing in concert, in, in a larger uh, societal system context, which I call the global system, and as a process, globalization. Uh, so, um, keeping this in mind, poor countries that can support democracy, uh, the key factor is, is the conditions under which uh, relations are taking place. If there is no tension, uh, no uh, un unusual tensions, it, it happens within what I call normal uh, political process um, or non-crisis process, the fact that marginal sectors are weak, that there's, they lack a, a coordinating uh, organization and networking, this alternative state, if that's not uh, present, 
uh, the marginal sector may be too weak and, and, and under-mobilized or even not mobilized, that really uh, even weak societal groups can form uh, working relationships with state groups and basically put into practice what I've, I've talked about as the way democracy emerges, which is a limited democracy in which marginal sectors vote but they have little other access or um, influence over the political system. That their votes, because they're uninformed, um, that they don't know who the leaders are, they don't know who they're voting for, they're voting basically blindly or randomly, and their vote has no net effect on determining outcomes. That if you have an uninformed electorate, um, you can have democratic votes, but the vote is actually determined uh, by that uh, part of the population that is informed, that they're the only ones that can vote in a coordinated fashion and vote consistently for one candidate over, the, over another, whereas in many cases, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uninformed vote, uh, votes mainly randomly. So these democratization processes can uh, uh, be observed. They can uh, be implanted. They can persist over limited periods of time, but they tend to be displaced under crisis conditions. Um, whenever there's uh, an increase in tensions, whenever things aren't working properly, whenever there are disagreements and disputes, the number of these disputes, the value of these disputes, uh, tends to create greater tension, greater crises uh, for uh, the articulation of public policy and decision making that uh, democratic procedures in weak democracies, limited democracies, or pseudo-democracies will break down and will be replaced by more autocratic forms of governance. So the middle ground uh, that we're seeing uh, coming and emerging in the first part of the 21st century in weak, um, underdeveloped, or poorly developed societal systems are one-party dominant uh, systems where you have seemingly democratic votes, but the party, uh, there's a single party that controls the levers of the electoral process. Um, they control the distribution of resources. They control uh, media, communication, social networks. And they tend to uh, persist over time. They get re-elected, they get re-voted, um, and they really act as one-party states. Uh, very similar to what happened in the 20th century with uh, socialist uh, one-party states, which were hegemonic uh, one-party states rather than uh, one-party do one dominant states. But they act the same way. They discipline the relationship between uh, state groups and civil society groups, and this can only be successful when marginal groups, as I, as I pointed out, remain weak, uh, unorganized, um, and unable to actually challenge uh, central authority or present an argument for injustice that can uh, sh cause a shift of loyalties from civil society towards the marginal sector. Uh, one thing that I think we do understand about democratization processes is that they cannot occur in any case, unless there is a, 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 um, a confluence of interests between uh, established state groups or uh, political elites and civil society groups. A civil society cannot establish a democracy without the uh, cooperation of state, uh, existing state groups. That if state groups decide to resist the democratization, uh, you will have a, a reversal of that process. Civil society groups rarely, if ever, can openly challenge uh, the authority of ruling elites and the state structure unless the state structure itself collapses or, or bifurcates, splits uh, into um, groups uh, that um, one of which then can side with civil society and uh, preclude uh, a direct confrontation between the st uh, state ruling uh, groups and civil society groups.